So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. Uh, today we're going to be going right where Audrey left off at verses 19 through 29. Hey, my jelly bean just fell on the ground. Oh, not cool. All right. Um, so our passage here takes place Sunday evening of the Passion Week, uh, the evening that that tomb was empty. And a lot has gone on over the past couple days for the disciples. Uh, Thursday night, they ate a meal with Jesus. That same night, he's arrested. Um, by Friday morning, before the sun comes up, he's already been on trial and been found guilty. And as the sun rises, he's brought before Pilate, and shortly therefore, thereafter, he's condemned to crucifixion, death by crucifixion. By 9 a.m. on Friday, he is being nailed to a cross. At noon, the sky darkens as um, the punishment for sins uh, is placed upon his shoulders. Then three hours later, he utters, it is finished, and dies. Shortly thereafter, a sword is thrust through his side to confirm that he is dead. He's taken down and wrapped in burial clothes by Nicodemus and Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. By sundown on Friday, Jesus is lying dead, sorry about that, is lying dead in a sealed tomb. All this while, the disciples are in hiding. They fleed uh, when Jesus was arrested, all but John. So Saturday passes, then comes Sunday morning, as Audrey read. Um, if we look at all the Gospels, uh, we can kind of piece together exactly what happened here. The women all go to the empty tomb, to the tomb, uh, to prepare Jesus with spices, and they find that it is empty. Mary Magdalene runs back to tell Peter and John the news. The other women, while she's gone, are visited by an angel. Peter and John, as Audrey read, run to find the tomb empty. While Mary Magdalene is most likely coming back to the tomb, not as fast as Peter and John, Jesus visits her. And then the other women are visited by an angel. Oh, that already happened. Never mind. Then, appears, then Jesus appears to the other women who go and tell all the disciples who are all gathered together at this point. <clears throat> at some point, Jesus appears to Peter, then to the two men on the road to Emmaus. And then we get to our passage tonight. The disciples are together together on Sunday evening in a locked room. And you can imagine everything that is going on in their heads at this point. Uh, they got to be thinking, is this real? Are the women lying about this? Is that tomb really empty? Or, I mean, did Peter and John, did they go to the wrong tomb maybe? Or Peter, who's seen Jesus, did I see a ghost? Was that real? Was I dreaming? In 72 hours, they've gone from eating a meal with Jesus, having him wash their feet, to his arrest, crucifixion, and then an empty tomb on Sunday morning with people claiming that they'd seen him. And that is where we are. Here tonight. So let's go ahead and read verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Um, 
is for everything we've remembered uh, over the past couple days, your sacrifice on our behalf, um, your blood shed for our forgiveness. And we thank you for Sunday morning when that tomb was empty to show that you were victorious, your sacrifice accepted. Now we thank you for the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. It's not anymore about us. It's not about how good a people we can be or our striving. But it's all about Christ and what he's done. God, I pray that you'd show us your glory here tonight, that we would see just how you have done everything. And it's all by your wonderful grace. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're just going to kind of go over three things that Jesus says here tonight. It's not like we're not going to go verse by verse or anything like that, but we're going to, we're going to talk about three things that Jesus says. First thing he says to the disciples on that first night, he says, peace be with you. Now, it says the doors are locked here. Um, why were they locked? Um, well, the disciples kind of thought that they were going to be the next ones dangling on a cross. Um, we see that. I mean, if they came and they arrested Jesus and crucified him, why not them? Why not take them all out? Now, Sunday night, there's an empty tomb. Who do you think they're going to come looking for first? Probably his disciples, right? And so here they are all huddled together with the doors locked. Um, they had all fled at Jesus' arrest, and now um, they feared they were still being pursued. Um, but then Jesus shows up, and we don't know exactly how Jesus shows up. It doesn't say if he miraculously opened the locked door, if he walked through a wall, or if he just appeared. When we see Jesus' Jesus's resurrection appearances, uh, we know that he could be touched. We know that he could eat food. It says he did all those things. Yet he seems to appear and disappear seemingly out of nowhere throughout. Now, the disciples were already really, really, really afraid, and now there's a dead man who's standing amongst them. So you can imagine what they're going through at that point. But it's then that they hear that familiar voice of their master, the one that they had left everything to follow for the, for the last three and a half years. That familiar voice calls out and says, peace be with you. It's like he's saying, guys, don't be afraid. Come and look at my hands. Come and see the marks on my side. It's me. I'm alive. You don't need to be afraid anymore. You don't really ever need to be afraid again. Now, they'd already seen Jesus do mighty miracles, uh, give sight to the blind, cleanse lepers, raise the dead. But here, he himself had conquered death, and he says to them, peace be with you, don't be afraid. And you know what happened? After seeing the risen Lord and after receiving the Holy Spirit, they no longer were. The same disciples who ran like cowards at Jesus' arrest all suffered and were killed for proclaiming Jesus. Some 10 years later, some 20 years later, some 30 years later for proclaiming that he was God and that he had risen from the dead. They went from cowards to conquerors. How? Why? Because they had seen the risen Lord. They saw Jesus for who he was, God, and they knew that they belonged to him. What did they have to be afraid of? The world tells us there's a lot that we should be afraid about. World War III, nuclear disaster, civil war, the next pandemic, global warming, economic collapse, hyperinflation, yada, 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 and go on and on and on of all the things we should fear in this life. And you know what? We're probably going to see at least one of those things in our lifetimes. But my point is this. If you belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, the one who rose from the dead, what do you have to be afraid of? Because he still says to his church today, peace be with you. That tomb was empty. Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. Our sins are forgiven. No longer are we separated from God, but rather now he calls us sons and daughters, and he has promised us eternal life in his kingdom. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise, and we will live in his presence forever and ever and ever. What 
do we have to fear? If God is for us, who can be against us? Doesn't mean we won't face hardships in this life, but what it does mean is in the midst of hardships, we can have peace. 1,990 years ago, the risen Lord told 10 scared disciples, peace be with you. And he tells his church the same exact thing today. Jesus said in John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, be courageous. I have conquered the world. Next, he says, I am sending you. So Jesus calms their fears, and again he says, peace be with you. Then he tells them that he is going to send them out. Just as the Father sent Jesus into the world to proclaim good news of the forgiveness of sins, to bring people back into a relationship with God. So now Jesus is going to send his disciples out to do the same exact thing, to be his hands and feet, to extend his mission. You guys get that? Like, we're who Jesus has called to further his mission here on earth. We, everyone in this room, we're the ones who are to be the hands and the feet of Christ right now. And he says, it's better for you that I go, for I'll send you the Holy Spirit. Because now, you know what, we can be in every continent in the whole United States doing the work of our Lord. But he doesn't just leave us to ourselves. He doesn't leave us solo. In Matthew 28, 20, the Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And know this, I am with you always to the very end of the age. How does he do that? Through his Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what we see here. He commissions them. He says, you're going to go out. And then he breathes on them and gives him the Holy Spirit to guide them on their mission. It's very reminiscent of when God, in Genesis 2, he molds Adam together, and then he breathes into him, into his mouth, and he has life. And here Jesus breathes on his disciples to give them new life in the Spirit. Go ahead and turn over to this Ezekiel 37 passage. We see the same idea right here in talking about the new covenant. In Ezekiel 36, the prophet has just spoken about this new covenant that God is going to make with all of God's people. And he says, it's going to be different in this way because why? I'm going to write my law in your heart. I'm going to put my spirit within you and I'm going to change you from the inside out. I'm going to cause you to walk in my ways. And then in Ezekiel 37, he has this vision. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and you will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, and there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares 
the Lord. That is a picture of the new covenant of what we have in Christ today. And it's a picture exactly of what was going on when Jesus breathed on his disciples 1,990 years ago. God takes spiritually dead people and gives them new life. That's what Christianity is all about. That's what it is. It's not about our church attendance. It's about people who have been born again with the Holy Spirit, who God has breathed on and given new life to. Not only did God send his son to die in our place and forgive us our sins, but those who have put their faith in Jesus receive the Holy Spirit who comes into their hearts and changes them from the inside out, causing them to be born again, and they are made into new creatures. 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That, that word there for creation, you can translate that as creature as well. He's a new person, brand new. Now, you may have tracked with me up to that point. Um, now you think, think I'm getting a little bit, maybe a lot crazy, and I, I really can't uh, blame you. I thought it was all crazy until it happened to me. This whole born again, being filled with the Spirit thing. But here's the deal. I, I could start pulling people up here right now. I'll pull Brennan up here. I'll pull Cole up here. I'll pull Wade up here. I'll pull Michael up here. I'll pull Max up here. I'll pull Rachel up here. I'll pull... I'll just keep pulling people up here. And I'll have them give you your testimony, and they're all going to say the same exact thing. I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and everything started to change. Everything. Things I used to love, I now loathe. Pornography. Lust. Drunkenness. Things I used to love, I, I, don't, I hate them now. I don't want to do them. And the things I used to loathe, I love. God's word. Going to church. Praying. The people I used to despise, the people I thought that I could never, ever forgive in my life, I've forgiven them. The sin that I was in bondage to, and no matter how much hard I tried, I could not stop. I'm free. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, doesn't mean I don't sin. But he's freed me. He's made me new. I'm a new person. Now, quite often celebrities fall into some sort of scandal and they come back some time later and they say, I'm a new pe person, I'm a changed man, right? And we're very skeptical, right? It's hard to say whether they're lying or not. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you this in all honesty. Like, um, when I look back on my old life, who I was before I met Christ, I feel like I wasn't even the same person. I feel like I was a totally different person. Like, I think about the things I did. I know I did them. I'll take full responsibility for everything I did. But when I seriously look at it, I'm like, that's not me. That wasn't me. And it's not a cop-out. Like I said, I take full responsibility, and I apologize to anyone I hurt back then. But at the same time, something inside me says, it's not you anymore, Brian. It's not you. I'm a new creation in Christ. So what I'm trying to say here is as miraculous as it was for Jesus to stand in the midst of those disciples in that room 1,990 years ago, it's no less miraculous what he continues to do today, giving life to dead people. Next point, he says to the skeptic Thomas, believe now, no one really knows where Thomas was on that first Sunday, probably hiding out somewhere. We don't know. But then he came back to the disciples, maybe after word had gotten out that that tomb was empty, just to see what was going on. And they say to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas doesn't believe them. He think, maybe he thinks they saw a ghost. Maybe he thought they were delirious from lack of sleep, that they were hallucinating. You can imagine if your friends said they saw a dead person come back to life. You'd think they were on edibles or something like that, right? Thomas doesn't believe. He says, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, 
I will never believe. Eight, eight days go by. It's actually one week. Uh, it would be the next Sunday. In um, how uh, the Jewish people kept time is that day also counted as a day. So when we say that Jesus was dead for three days, you're like, hey, that wasn't three days. Well, it was, he died on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so they count that as three days. And so it's the same thing here when he says eight days. That Sunday counted as a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so it makes it eight. So the next Sunday, they're all gathered together again, and Jesus comes back, and again, he comes with the peace be with you, and he goes straight to Thomas right here, and he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That speaks of us today. You see, Thomas, he needed more. He needed to see to believe. He needed more evidence to believe that Jesus rose from the dead like many people today. Just like Thomas, 1,990 years ago, uh, people have their doubts. There's been all sorts of reasons that people put out for that tomb being empty. Um, people say that the, all the disciples hallucinated about seeing Jesus. I don't really think that's hallu how hallucinations work. I, I do remember in my past life, I don't think that's how they work. Um, with everyone seeing the same stuff, there's actually something called the swoon theory, and people believe that he actually wasn't dead that he was crucified and he was, you know, he was uh, whipped and everything like that, but he really didn't die, and then he went to the tomb, and the cool of the tomb resuscitated him, and he rolled, a, rolled away that tomb, and uh, he was fine after that. That's, a, that's an actual theory that people have come up with with PhDs and whatnot to why that uh, tomb was empty. Some people say there was a lookalike. That's actually what Islam believes, that Allah put someone who looked like Jesus up there, but the real Jesus actually... What, didn't die at all. That's kind of weird that Allah would deceive all those people into believing in Jesus. I don't get that, but whatever. Um, some people think it's a myth. Doesn't check out when you look at how we have uh, documents from 15 years later that talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Generally, it takes hundreds of years for that to happen, and others say that the disciples stole the body. Well, they died for a lie then. They were all murdered for a lie. And I could go on and much, much more evidence to dispel a lot of those theories, and I'd love to discuss them with you if you want. But the fact is this, there's been a great many people who have sincerely sought the truth regarding the resurrection and in their search have proclaimed, my Lord and my God, because they saw where the evidence pointed to and knew, like Thomas, that if Jesus rose from the dead, that he was exactly who he claimed to be, God. So if you're here today and you're skeptical, I can't blame you. I've been there. I've done that. I can't pull up a YouTube video and show you him walking out of the grave. I can't bring him up here and have you feel his side and see his hands. If you're here today and you're skeptical, I'll ask you this. Please know there's no judgment in this place either. If you're here and you're skeptical, I'll ask you this. Do you really want to know the truth of whether Jesus rose from the dead? Do you? Do we really want to know the truth of whether Jesus rose from the dead? You see, we all claim to want to know the truth, but oftentimes we really don't because the truth has implications. It changes things. It changes our lives, sometimes very drastically. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we often don't want things to change. If Jesus rose from the dead, then there's only one reasonable response, and that's to fall down and say, my Lord and my God. If God came down 2,020 years ago and died for the sins of humanity and rose from the dead and calls all people to turn from their ways and to trust in him, well, that's going to change some things, isn't it? The first being that I'm not Lord and I'm not God. I'm not the master of my life. I'm not the authority of my life any longer. There is an authority far greater than me that I am subject to. As humans, we don't like that. We don't like the fact that we're not in control. It's uncomfortable. So what we see from Thomas is he needed 
to see the hands. He needed to feel his side to believe. What do you need? To believe. What question do you need answered? My question, next question would be, if like Thomas, the evidence you seek is met, your questions are answered, are you willing to fall down and surrender and exclaim, my Lord and my God? Because oftentimes we're just not willing to do that. If you're not willing to fall down and say, my Lord and my God, there will never be enough evidence and you will always have another question until your heart is ready. I say all of this out of love. I don't mean to be adversarial, to make people uncomfortable. I, say, I seek the same exact thing that John did when he wrote this book. It actually comes right after our passage today. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Say this so you would have life in his name, that you would believe in him and have new life, eternal life in him. I got no skin in this. It doesn't benefit me at all. I just want people to have what I have. I just want people to know Jesus the way I know him because there's no better life than that. I have tasted and I have seen that there is nothing greater in this life than belonging to Jesus and knowing him and living in his way. He's given me new life and he's set me free and that's what I want for everyone in this room, to have the peace and joy that come only from belonging to Christ Jesus, from knowing yourself as a son and a daughter of the living God. like this. I can stand up here and say, I've tasted, I've seen, I've tried this. This is really good. You've got to have it. It's so good. It's the best. And your family and your friends can tell you, this is the best. You've got to have it. There's nothing better than this. But you still have to taste it, and you still have to take it yourself. We all have to believe individually to taste and see. And I promise you this, that when you do, you'll see that there is nothing greater than Jesus, our Lord and our God. Let's pray.